What's up guys, welcome back to my first video in 2023. I wish you guys a great start and uh, everything. So for today, I figured it would be really interesting to look back and cover some major changes that 2022 has brought into the fashion industry, specifically in terms of leadership and creative direction. So long story short, we are gonna go over major shakeups of 2022 who exited, who is new, what to expect in future, etc. Now, 2022 was super eventful in the fashion industry. This was comeback year for many brands after the long and slow lockdowns. It should not come as a surprise that many brands had to change their strategies and reshape their visions. Post-lockdown fierce competition and sluggish growth forced companies to contemplate their future paths. So it's natural that many brands found themselves unaligned with their creative directors and head designers. So the shuffle began. We saw big resignations, even big designers closing their eponymous labels. Especially the end of the year was super chaotic. From Alessandro Michele's departure from Gucci to Ralph Simmons closing his namesake label and even more. All right, without further ado, here are the top six fashion brands with recent major shakeups. Alessandro Michele exited Gucci after extraordinary seven-year run. So he took the creative reins of Italy's largest luxury brand in 2015. He replaced a fellow Italian fashion designer, Frida Giannini. Alessandro Michele presented his last collection back in September. The reason for his abrupt departure still unclear. As Michele said in his statement, they parted the ways because of different perspectives that uh, he and the management had. What it seems like to be a problem is that Gucci reportedly missed its third quarter sale estimates for 2022. This due to a sluggish growth compared to other carrying own brands, especially Saint Laurent. Gucci's underperformance and slow growth has slowed Kering's overall performance in the luxury market. There is still rebounding from the pandemic and some broader economic signs of recession. All right, so how good was Alessandro Michele at Gucci and what exactly went wrong? The highlights of his Gucci times include his gender fluid 70 silhouettes and bright colors that energized the brand and resonated well with celebrities. Jared Leto, Lana Del Rey and Harry Styles were all huge fans. In terms of collaborations, Michele orchestrated collabs with brands like Supreme and Balenciaga. Michele's endeavors brought huge success to the luxury house. He expanded its reach beyond the brand's core customer base, attracting younger and more diverse customers. After his appointment, Gucci sales grew exponentially and so did the image of the brand. Also, it was on Michele's watch that Ridley Scott's House of Gucci was released. Of course, the movie pushed the Gucci hype even higher. His last show, in my opinion, was also pretty good. He presented his signature androgynous looks with splash of classic tailoring. Michele calls this collection Welcome to Twinsburg. Concept of twins here came into play because his mother was a twin and Michele always felt that he had two mothers. Last but not least, Alessandro Michele brought his magic touch also to Gucci's high jewelry. In fact, he was the one who introduced a high jewelry line at Gucci. Despite all the success, problems started to appear right after the pandemic. Critics say that he could not keep up with other creative directors of carrying own brands in terms of boosting sales. Again, it's really hard to speculate like this. What we know for sure is that Michele is gone and his successor still unknown. Gucci's design team will lead the house forward until a new creative director is announced. The same design team will present their first collection this month on 13th of January. Now, the question is who is gonna replace Alessandro Michele? There have been some rumors going around that Tom Ford might be coming back to Gucci. After selling his namesake brand to Estee Lauder, Tom Ford is to remain in place as creative director until the end of 2023. So it might be that Gucci design team will stay in charge until the end of the year. And after that, we might see the return of Tom Ford, the designer whose luxurious minimalism brought huge fame to Gucci in 90s. Another option for Gucci would be someone from other carrying own brands. Gucci management and 
Kering might go for a safer option and appoint either Bottega's Matthew Blasey or Anthony Vaccarello from St. Laurent. This is highly unlikely, but you never know, crazy things do happen in fashion a lot. Other names that we can speculate include Ricardo Tisci, who recently exited Burberry. Well, we are gonna cover this one next. In September 2022, Ricardo Tisci exited British fashion house Burberry. He was replaced by Daniel Lee, formerly of Bottega. Tisci joined Burberry from Givenchy in March 2018. He was hired to energize and modernize Burberry. He was tasked to combine streetwear with high fashion, which in fact he did. In his almost five years tenure, he revamped the brand image, modernized the range and reached a younger customer base. He brought a new attitude too. Burberry's long-standing logo was replaced and updated with boxy-looking font. Tishy also introduced a new monogram, TB, based on Thomas Burberry's initials, which the brand used a lot, especially across the backs. Tishy's last collection for spring-summer 23 was unveiled in a London warehouse. The show had been postponed due to the funeral of the Queen and finally was presented later in September, squeezed between Milan and Paris Fashion Week. Now the question is what really happened and why Tishi is being replaced with Daniel Lee. Critics argued that Tishi failed to make the most of Burberry's British heritage and that there was a sense of disconnect between his designs and the brand's history. In addition to this looks like his designs were not resonating strongly on social media, resulting overall poor social media presence. In my opinion, the change was simply dictated by the new CEO of Burberry, Jonathan Ackeroyd, who replaced Marco Gobetti just five, six months before the announcement of Tishi's departure. Marco Gobetti was the one who brought Tishi on board. The new CEO, Jonathan Ackeroyd, joined Burberry from Versace and obviously had a new vision for the brand, and Ricardo Tisci was not part of it. So, to execute his own agenda and vision, Jonathan Ackeroyd put Daniel Lee in charge. Alright, so what should we expect from Lee, and is he a better fit for the job? Probably when it comes to Daniel Lee, first thing that pops up in everyone's mind is his abrupt departure from Bottega in 2021. Even now, no one knows what actually happened. This was really a shock to everyone because Bottega was doing great at his watch. From 2018 to 2021, Lee remolded Bottega into a hype label. His pouch and cassette bags were instant hits, and Bottega's signature bright green became the hottest color in fashion. Not to mention Lee's attempts to change rules of traditional fashion by hosting shows not in Milan, but in Detroit and in Berlin. He staged a highly secretive fashion show in Berlin's famous techno club Berkheim, and then out of the blue, Lee was fired. Rumors were that he clashed with staff, but actual reasons were largely unclear. Anyways, looks like new CEO of Burberry does not care about the past speculations and scandals, and fully trusts Lee to support his vision. In my opinion, Lee is gonna do great at Burberry. Let's start that Lee is British and understands well the heritage and values of Burberry. Also, as we learned from the brand's press release, Burberry is gonna go big on accessories. And first thing on new CEO's agenda is to grow accessories more than 50% of sales. Clearly, when it comes to accessories, Daniel Lee is the best guy for the job. That already he proved at Bottega. Luckily, we don't have to wait that long to find out. Liz Berber's debut is scheduled for February 20th. Italian fashion house Ferragamo now has a new creative director, Maximilian Davis. He succeeded Paul Andrew in March 22, who left the company the year prior. Maximilian is a young fashion designer from Manchester, who is a graduate of London College of Fashion. He worked as a designer for Wales Bonner for a while, and after that he founded his namesake label in 2020. His first appearance at London Fashion Week was a real success. Alright, so because he got the new job as a creative director of Ferragamo, he had to put his namesake label on hold. He even withdrew from LVMH prize competition 
where he was a semi-finalist. This new chapter for Ferragamo started with appointing new CEO Marco Gobetti, who joined from Burberry. He is tasked to bring a new generation of fashion-forward customers to this once revolutionary but lately conservative house. Marco Gobetti was the one who brought Maximilian on board. According to his official statement, qualities that defines Maximilian Davis' work are elegance, refined sensuality and the constant commitment to quality. In fact, Davis debuted his first collection for the brand back in September at Milan Fashion Week. With this collection, he tried to re-energize Italian brand. He introduced some elements of fetishism in the collection, such as glossy leather and second skin fits. Tailoring was presented in chunky shapes featuring details such as sash details and removed sleeves. This collection also unveiled a new house color, Ferragamo Red. Obviously, it was inspired by an iconic pair of sparkling red shoes that designer Salvatore Ferragamo made for Marilyn Monroe in 1959. As Davis said after the show, he is developing new fabrications and introducing new silhouettes and trying to understand what the younger client needs to make it success. Keen and Veronica Etro, who have been designing their namesake brand for 30 years, stepped down and gave the Etro reins to Marco Di Vincenzo. He is now new creative director across women's, men's and home. He officially started back in summer 2022. He debuted his first women's wear collection in September at Milan Fashion Week. Probably you wondering why this change and why now? Well, the move came after the Etro family sold a majority stake to the private equity firm El Carreton, and El Carreton hired Marco Di Vincenzo, an Italian designer from Messina, who is also a head designer for leather goods at Fendi. Surprisingly, he will remain at Fendi while acting as a creative director at Etro and also will oversee his namesake label. Well, this is truly a lot of work. When it comes to his own brand, he launched it in 2009 and later received investment from LVMH. Same LVMH owns Fendi and also is involved in El Carreton. So now you can see why El Carreton actually hired him and how he ended up at Etro. Alright, so Marco De Vincenzo is tasked to evolve Etro's pattern saturated aesthetic in his own distinct direction. In addition, he is expected to reform and revamp the Etro accessory line. Obviously, this should not be a problem for Marco, given his position at Fendi and also his proficiency in designing bags. Keen and Veronica Etro will continue to be involved with the house strategy and will support Marco Di Vincenzo. Alright, let's take a look at Marco Di Vincenzo's first Etro Women's Wear collection that debuted in September. As he said before the show, he relied on his imagination and intuition this time, because he did not have the luxury of deep diving into the wonderful Etro archives, and this is clearly seen in the collection. Etro's most recognizable paisley pattern and the fringe gypsy look or the romantic sweeping gowns was nowhere to be seen. He used a lot of bold visuals though, and played a lot with new jacquard textures and a variety of decorative motifs. Anyways, guys, don't wanna go into much details here. What I think is that it was a really nice start and uh, the rest will remain to be seen. And of course, I'm looking forward to see his first menswear collection, which is scheduled on 15th of January. And the Mulemister has been without a creative director since Sebastian Mounier exited the brand in 2020. Well, not anymore. It's been revealed that and the Mulemistor has a new creative director, Ludovic Di Sanserna. This decision marks a shift for the Claudio Antonioli owned brand, which has been run by an in house design team until now. Antonioli bought and the Mulemistor brand in 2020. Like the Mulemistor, Ludovic was born in Belgium, but actually he was raised in Paris. He worked for prominent French houses, including Balmain before launching his eponymous label in 2017. He is known for genderless and a binary-breaking approach to clothing design. Ludovic Dissoncerne is a big fan of exposed skin. 
putting all genders in sheer suits, crystal mesh tanks, and lace of briefs. Long story short, he is known for his sensual and individuality driven take on fashion. So guys, you may wondering why him and how he can be a good fit for Endemule Mister. Well, as you know, the DNA of the brand includes gothic, punk and Japanese cool styles. The intersection of where the two aesthetics may meet is a genderless dressing. As Endemule Mister said in one of her interviews to Vogue, she was interested in the tension between masculine and feminine, but also the tension between masculine and feminine within one person. For sure, she and Dissan Cerne have that sentiment in common. Most likely, Ludovic will continue his gender fluid designing at Endemule Mister while bringing a bit more skin to the brand. But of course, it's really hard to speculate like this. We'll have to wait until next March to find out. He will showcase his debut collection in March at Paris Fashion Week. For now, we are told that sensuality, tension, silhouette and fluidity and also wildness are defining pillars of the language that Ludovic de Saint-Cerne is about to build as he starts a new chapter of Endemule Mister. After 27 years of his namesake label, Raph Simons, a legendary Belgian designer, announced that his spring-summer 2023 collection would be the last. The shocking announcement came via Instagram in November 22. Raph Simons launched his namesake label in 1995. He is well known for his love for rebellious youth cultures and for his elegant minimal silhouettes. Raph Simons did not explain why he was closing the label. However, there are a few points we can go over. Let's start that post-pandemic market turbulence likely played a role, as a relatively smaller and independent brand such as Ralph Simmons, probably it was really hard to compete with bigger and well-established fashion houses. There is also speculation that Simmons wanted to focus fully on his co-creative director role at Prada alongside Mutual Prada and then eventually assume all the responsibilities after her retirement. However, this was denied by Mutual Prada. Anyways, this situation reminded me the time when Demna was appointed as a creative director at Balenciaga. He decided to concentrate on his new job while seizing all his association with Wetemont, the brand that he founded together with his brother. Alright, so what's next for Ralph Simmons? Well, let's start that Ralph Simmons has not gone gone. He is still at Prada, designing women's and menswear line with equal responsibilities and decision-making as Mucha Prada. Rumors are that Ralph has a contract without end at Prada, similar to the lifelong arrangement Karl Lagerfeld had with Fendi. That sounds like a lot of security and work. Maybe Ralph will do something else altogether, a different project of some kind, which is highly unlikely, of course. All we can do is wait and see. Meanwhile, looking forward to see his Prada collection for upcoming Milan Fashion Week. Alright, guys, that sums up today's video. Hope this one was an informative and also entertaining. Again, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you guys in the next video. Peace.